All right, this morning we're going to be in the 38th chapter of Jeremiah. If you want to make your way there as we continue our study through the book of Jeremiah. And as you guys are landing in Jeremiah 38, let me remind you that Jeremiah chapters 37, 38, 39, they all deal with the last 18 months of the nation of Judah and the reign of King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah is a very weak man on a very large stage. He's a man who privately wants to know the word of the Lord from the prophet Jeremiah, but publicly he's too fearful to follow and to actually act on what he knows. So in chapter 37, Jeremiah is imprisoned by the princes for prophesying that Jerusalem is going to fall to the Babylonian siege. And he's thrown into a dungeon, a pit, a cistern. He's only removed secretly by Zedekiah so that Zedekiah can question him further on the word of the Lord. And when Jeremiah begs for his life, don't throw me back in the pit, then he is put in the court of the prison, which is more like a normal prison, and he's actually fed bread, and, and he can sustain himself there. And so that's the backdrop for chapter 38. Now verse 1, Shephtiah the son of Matan, and Gedaliah the son of Pasher, and Jukal the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to all the people, saying... And in chapter 29, Jeremiah had already said what he'd been telling Zedekiah privately. Thus says the Lord, he who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. His life shall be as a prize to him, and he shall live. And thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, and he shall take it. Therefore the princes said to the king, Please let us put this man to death. For thus he weakens the hands. He's, he's killing morale of the men of war who remain in the city and the hands of the people by speaking such words to them. For this man does not seek the welfare of the people, but their harm. And then Zedekiah the king said, Look, he's in your hand, for the king can do nothing against you. I've got no power against my princes. Now, Jeremiah is taken uh, from the court, and in verse 6, they took then him and cast him back into the dungeon, or the pit, that he had just been taken out of by the king, and it was the king's son's house. These cisterns, these dungeons, these pits acted as uh, reservoirs when it was wet, and then they became stinky and nasty when it started to dry, and they became uh, prison cells. And they let Jeremiah down there with ropes, and in the dungeon he sank because there was no water. He was in the mire. So he's put back in this place because of the charge of treason. Now again, last week I shared with you that this would be akin to Farmington being surrounded by Iran, and then me getting up on a Sunday morning and saying, God told me that everybody who would defect to a Muslim nation, to Iran, and not fight, but just give up our land, you will live, and you patriots on 4th of July, you who will defend your country to the death, you will die. Thus saith the Lord. I'd be very popular, just like Jeremiah. And so the princes are people who, they have this fight to the last man mentality, although that's how governments and people always are. They're not afraid to put... Uh, the masses into the killing fields, but they're going to run when it all goes down and the people are going to die. And so King Zedekiah, here he is, he's in this position where he actually supports, as I told you, Jeremiah privately, but when the princes come to him, then he just doesn't have enough backbone to stand up to them. So he says, I can't do anything because he fears uh, those who are in power. 
And so he lets them throw Jeremiah back into the pit. Now, uh, Jeremiah has begged to be taken out of this pit for fear of his life. And Zedekiah can't stand up because of fear. And you need to understand this is the most motivating influence in Zedekiah's life is fear. And he's not so unlike many of us. What we fear is what drives us. So he throws Jeremiah or lets him be thrown back into the pit. Now here's a guy who's completely opposite to Zedekiah, a guy named, verse 7, Ebed-Melech. He steps in, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house, and he heard that they had put Jeremiah back in the dungeon, or the pit, the cistern, when the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin. In those days, the gates were like uh, houses. The walls were thick, sometimes 20, 30 feet thick, thick and the, the gates would act as like meeting places for officials. So there was the king sitting there in the gate of Benjamin, and Ebed-Melech went from the king's house to the king at the gate and spoke to him, and he said, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they've cast back into the dungeon. And he's likely to die from hunger in the place where he is, for there's no more bread in the city. And then the king, see how he's a, a double-minded man, as James would say in all of his ways. The king now commands Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, and said, Now take 30 men with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and they took from there old clothes and old rags and let them down by ropes into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And then ebed the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, Please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. And so they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained now back in the court of the prison. So here's this guy. Um, this guy named Ebed Melech. Uh, he is, by definition, his name, the servant of the king. That's what his name means. He's an interesting guy because he's both Ethiopian, which would make him modern day Sudanese, not from Israel. Uh, he's also a eunuch. And in those days, rather inhumanely, the kings would take some of their highest level servants that were in charge of the most, and they would make them eunuchs, uh, believing that it would keep them from uh, rising up against the king, take the aggression out of them. So here's a man who doesn't necessarily have a ton of power or position in the country other than he is a servant of the king. And he's an interesting guy because he proves to us that you do not have to have the greatest power to actually intercede for someone. And he is a guy who intercedes to the king and then practically gets involved. It has been said that mercy is actually defined as compassion in action. I've been blessed because my mom has a gift of mercy and then I married Lucinda who has the gift of mercy and compassion in action is an interesting thing because the person who has the gift of mercy and is willing to act out on it is a person who sees a problem and then doesn't take a lot of power or influence on any of our part to intercede spiritually with the Lord for someone else to pray. But then the person who has the gift of mercy, they'll say, that's not enough. I'm going to go take a step and get involved. And years ago, my mom would always teach me, and she would tell me, she would say, you know, Mike, when people are having a tough time, it's not enough to just call and say, hey, can I help you, or do you need anything? She said, most people won't tell you what they really need. She said, just pray about it, go find something, and then go do it. So back in the day when there used to be lots of dinners after funerals at a person's house, my mom would always be seen doing the dishes. She never said, hey, would you like me to do the dishes? Somebody would say, no, no, don't, it's okay. She would just go do all the dishes and leave. And so Ebed Melech is, a, is an illustration of how we can intercede both spiritually and 
physically, practically in people's lives. He's also an interesting type of the Holy Spirit. He's the servant of the king. The Holy Spirit's role in the Trinity is to serve the king. He brings no attention to himself, but he desires to serve the king. And Romans chapter 8 verse 26 tells us that the Holy Spirit takes the Christian who is in such a bad spot that we don't even have the ability to pray prayers ourselves, and our spirit's just groaning from the pain. And he intercedes or translates the groanings we can't even utter. And this is what ebed Melech did for Jeremiah the prophet. I love this about the Lord, that he's always looking out for us. He's always making a way for the most vulnerable. Now, uh, ebed Melech is a guy who steps in at the risk of his own life because if the king's afraid of the princes, so ebed Melech should be. And yet, because he steps in to spare Jeremiah's life with compassion, and think about the compassion, by the way, the mercy. He rescues him from the pit, and the Bible goes out of the way to say he puts rags around the ropes so that they won't burn Jeremiah's tender flesh from being in the muck. You know, that's how it is. If you're in a damp, wet place, your skin's all wrinkled up, he has compassion. J just the other day, I took my youngest son, Luke, and one of his buddies to the Current River, and what I do when I take Luke, he likes to swim more and he likes to fish, so at the top of a big hole of water, I'll kick him out of the boat, and then he floats down while I fish, and mostly he runs all the fish off. You know, he's like a porpoise out there, kicking and spewing and throwing rocks. And, and so I pick him up at the other end. And at the end of the day, after we'd been out there four or five hours, we got in the vehicle and like 14-year-old boys will do, they start arguing about whose skin is the most wrinkled. And then when finally his friend has the most wrinkled skin, Luke, he, he figures he's got me. So he says, well, my skin's probably not as wrinkled because I'm more used to the water than you. And so here's Jeremiah. He's not used to being in the pit. Ebed Melech in compassion and mercy, he thinks of even the condition of his flesh. And next week when we get to chapter 39, verses 15, 16, and 17, finally 18, it's going to show us that Ebed Melech is told specifically by God that, look, I told everybody that wants to live to leave the city. But since Ebed Melech's in this interesting spot, He's a servant of the king, so he can't just defect and leave the king. He's got to be honoring his king, even though he's got a wicked king. And yet, here's the interesting thing. Since he stays in the city to honor his king, he also then stood up for God's prophet. And God says, while everybody else that wouldn't leave is going to die when the Babylonians come, you're going to live. I'm going to show you mercy for the mercy you have shown. And there's a theme in Scripture. I have it there for you in the blue. Mercy shown is mercy given. Next week we're going to talk more about this, but chapter 5 of Matthew in the 7th verse in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, blessed or happy is the merciful for they shall obtain what? Mercy. God's meticulous bookkeeper. And when we give mercy, God stores up mercy for the merciful. He gives us the love of people and the ability to show mercy, and then he rewards us for the mercy that we have shown. Now, in verse 14, Zedekiah, the king, then sent and had Jeremiah brought to him through the third entrance of the house. So, secretly, he tells ebed Melech to go save Jeremiah. Then he has Jeremiah brought to him through the third entrance in the house. And for all intents and purposes, in ancient times in Jerusalem, the king's palace had a connection to the temple via secret passageway. So see, he's still scared of the princes, so he has Jeremiah brought through this secret passageway to him so nobody will see. And then the king said to Jeremiah, I'm going to ask you something. Hide nothing from me. And Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I declare it to you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you advice, you won't listen to me. <laughs> he's had interactions with this guy before. So the king, Zedekiah, swore secretly to Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord lives, who made our very souls... I will not put you to death, nor will I give you into the hand of these men who seek your life. So the king, again, wants a secret word from Jeremiah from God. 
Interestingly enough, last week, here was our situation. The city is besieged for the last 18 months of Jerusalem's existence. At this time, it's besieged, essentially. Zedekiah gets word out last week to Pharaoh Hophra to give him some help. Hophra helps him, comes towards Jerusalem, and the Babylonians go, hey, you know what? I think we need to go fend this off. Now, interestingly enough, Zedekiah, in the previous chapter, before he had got a hold of Hophra, he looked around and he goes, I think we're about to go down here, so maybe we ought to get ourselves right with God. And so he made a decree that everybody would set their servants free. They'd been mistreating their own people. And uh, when then the Babylonians left the siege to fight with Egypt for a very short time, Zedekiah looks around and goes, hey, I think God answered our prayers. We let our servants go free, and God just saved us, and I think the Babylonians are going to leave. What should we do in response? Let's take all of our slaves back and mistreat them. Let's go right back to living the way we used to live. You ever had that happen in your life? God, please save me from this thing. Looks like he saved me. All right, let's go back status quo. Thanks, God. And so that's what happens here. Well, at that time, when the situation had changed and the Babylonians had left, he called Jeremiah in and said, hey, maybe God's got a different word. And Jeremiah said, same word, it's been for years. If you don't turn, you're going to burn, right? God's word doesn't change just because the circumstances change. In this case, the circumstances are exactly the same as last chapter. And Jeremiah now looks around and goes, hey, maybe because nothing's changed, God's word, maybe his word changed, God's word. But here's the deal. When God tells us to do a thing, as we've talked about, and we don't do that thing, then he won't give us another word until we do the first word. And what he's been telling Zedekiah and the people for years is, if you don't repent, you're going to be disciplined. And because they won't repent, they're going to be disciplined no matter what the circumstances look like. Now, practically, Jeremiah doesn't want to give the king this word again, not because he's scared of prison really as much as he doesn't trust the king. He's like, look, you might turn on me and I die. You know, I've seen your game before, but also mostly because he says here, you won't listen and you won't change. I, I've given you this word over and over and over, but you don't listen and you don't change. And I just want to take a minute and say that Zedekiah represents people both outside the church that kind of adhere to the fact that there is a God and even Christians inside the church in the sense that Zedekiah represents the person that wants God to speak to them. They want God involved in their life and God's favor, but they do not want to change and live according to God's word. And in James 1.22, uh, the way I learned this verse, it's James would say, I implore you to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. And I have up there for you a translation that says, do not merely listen to the word of God so that you deceive yourselves, but do what it says. And the difficulty is that the more you know about the Bible, the more you can assume you do the Bible <laughs> And that 18 inches, as it's been said, between your head and your heart may be the farthest road traveled in the Christian life. And so we can assume because we know that we do, but it not necessarily is the case. And the difference between knowing and doing, it's two different hemispheres. And the Bible has much to say about it. In fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, he said this in verse 46, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show him who he's like. And then he shows them this story, this parable, this illustration. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, could not shake it because it was founded on the rock. But he who heard it and did nothing is like a man who built on the earth or on the sand without foundation, and no foundation against which the stream then beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. 
what Jesus is teaching that living according to God's word is actually true wisdom. And wisdom is much different than knowledge. Knowledge is knowing something. But then wisdom is actually applying that knowledge and applying it correctly. To understand something and then to apply that knowledge correctly. And as I have shared with many of you, much to your chagrin, I'll share it with you again. Uh, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to use it in a fruit salad. And this is how God does. He gives us both knowledge and wisdom. And it's important because the carnal mind, which can in the Bible be associated with uh, the unsaved person, the unregenerated person, carnal means natural. The carnal mind, whether it's an unsaved or unregenerated person or a Christian living according to the ways and the methodology of the world as opposed to scripture, is without the understanding of the spiritual and God's revelation and knowledge. And without that, you can never truly have wisdom because wisdom issues forth from God. He is wisdom. And so you can't ever truly be wise without spiritual regeneration. And so the people who build their life on knowledge instead of applying it lack the understanding and the wisdom of God. Now, in Luke chapter 11, there is this woman who comes to Jesus, and uh, she makes a bold statement in public in verse 27. This woman raised her voice in the crowd, and she said to Jesus, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. This is a powerful statement. It's like, look at me. I know stuff about the Messiah. She recognized he was the Messiah. She proclaims him loudly, publicly. And Jesus' response is a little perplexing. In verse 28, he says, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and what? Keep it. He said, you know some stuff. This is a general rebuke. You know some stuff, but the general rebuke is you might want to do what you know. You know some stuff, but it's better to know some stuff and then do it than just to know it and proclaim it. You've got to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Now, in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, in the Christian church, when you think about how God saves people and the process of salvation, there seems to be two very polarizing camps. And it's funny in Christianity that people tend to migrate to one pole or the other when so much of the Bible to me is completely uh, yes and both. You know, when I read the Bible, I get a lot of, uh, is it this or that? Yes is my answer. I don't understand it all, but I think in heaven, it's going to make a lot of sense. And for me, I think my faith is reasonable and it's also a mystery. And if I can know everything there is to know about God, then he's not quite the God he proclaims to be in the Bible. But that said, what I do know is that there are these camps in Christianity, and, and there's the one camp that's, uh, this is the camp I grew up in, the once saved, always saved camp. Eternal security is their big thing. And so if I prayed a prayer at summer camp when I was in the second grade, I didn't ever have to go to church. I could live like hell. And then some pastor is going to preach me into heaven at my funeral because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, then you can be saved. You can be saved. But the interesting thing is God never in the New Testament talks about conversion. He always talks about discipleship. And discipleship is following. Jesus said, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples, not converts. So here you have uh, this group that says, if you said it, doesn't matter how you live, you're in. On the way other side of this whole deal are people who are like, doesn't matter what you said. If you prayed to ask Jesus in your heart and tomorrow you sin, you're on a slippery slope. You better turn or burn, bud. You're in, you're out. It's all based upon works 
And the two probably have some merit to both of them, but given the extremes, they turn into quite a heresy. When the Christian that reads the Bible understands this, Jesus picked me before the foundation of the world, but he also picked according to his foreknowledge, and he gave me by my free will an opportunity to accept him, but he'll never force me. And the way I understand it, if I accept him and follow him, then he's not going to chokehold me into following him. Just like the scripture says here, Jesus, if you continue or you abide with me, then you are truly my disciples. And while I am not the person who can say a person is saved or is not saved, what I know truly about myself, and as I judge the fruit of others, which I'm commanded to do if I care about people, continued obedience proves new birth. And so if Grandpa said a prayer all the way back in 1958, and then he never followed the Lord, Grandpa's going to hell. That's what the scriptures say. Doesn't matter what he prayed, his life will produce fruit so you will know a good tree from a bad tree. And so the only way that I can leave my family with any assurance or give myself any assurance aside from the Holy Spirit bearing witness within me that I am a Christian is I will continue in obedience. That's what proves new birth. That's what the scriptures say. So if you just know it and you don't do it, you're in a really bad spot. Now, obedience proves my love to God, but I love uh, this verse in John chapter 14. I'm going to read it for you, verse 21. It says this, He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So here's the interesting thing. If I obey God, it proves that I actually love God. I can only love him because he loved me first. But then obedience actually showers God's blessings upon me. What do you mean? Well, if you've ever been a kid, raise your hand if you've ever been a kid in here. <laughs> or you've had kids, you know this. Um, your parents in a, in a quasi-normal family. So we're all dysfunctional. Let's just admit that. You know, right? I'm from a dysfunctional family. We'll join the crowd. It's just levels of dysfunction. I mean, there are some that are way out there, but I mean, every family at its best is dysfunctional. So in like a quasi-normal, whatever that is, functional, <laughs> dysfunctional family, a functioning dysfunctional family, um, it looks like this. If you uh, give your kids rules, which you will because you love them and you want to keep them out of trouble, and they obey those rules, you don't love them any differently than if you had them break the rules but the way you relate to them, your blessings that you bestow upon them change greatly. If your kids obey, they receive more blessing, not more love, more blessing than if they disobey. And the same is true with our Heavenly Father. If we disobey, we don't receive all the blessings in this life that He has for us. And so Jesus says, look, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and then I will shower my love upon you. I'll reveal myself to you. Now, all that said, uh, Zedekiah here is an interesting guy because he is uh, completely a fraidy cat. And uh, after all that goes on with Zedekiah and his fear, he does tell Jeremiah, look, I'm not going to send you back into the prison. And Yet, interestingly enough, he never swears he will obey. <laughs> After all this, he swears, I won't throw you back into the prison myself. I won't let them kill you. But he never says, oh, okay, I'm finally going to obey. He still wants to know God cares for him and wants God to intervene in his life, but he doesn't want to obey. And so Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, that's the armies of heaven, the God of Israel, if you shall surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do surrender, uh, if you don't surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city is going to be given in the hand of the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians, they shall burn it with fire, 
and you shall not escape from their hand. This is exactly what he's been telling Zedekiah over and over. And Zedekiah the king said to Jeremiah, notice this, I am afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Babylonians or the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they abuse me. But Jeremiah said, they shall not deliver you. Please obey the voice of the Lord which I speak to you, so it shall be well with you and your soul shall live. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the word that the Lord has shown me. Now behold, all the women who are left in the king of Judah's house shall be surrendered to the king of Babylon's princes. And these women, they'll sing a little song like this, or they'll say, your close friends have set upon you and prevailed against you, and your feet have sunk in the mire, and they have turned away again. Essentially, your women and your children will be ravished by the Babylonians, and you'll have been the one who done it to them. And so they shall surrender all your wives and your children to the, to the Chaldeans. And you shall not escape from their hand, but you shall be taken by hand to the king of Babylon, and you shall cause this city to be burned with fire. And then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, notice the fear again, shh, let no one know these words, and you shall not die. This guy is all about self-preservation. I mean, Jeremiah doesn't just, he doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to go back to the pit. But he actually loves the Lord, so he has something bigger than himself in mind. Zedekiah is willing to sacrifice everything for self-preservation. He doesn't understand Jeremiah's motivation. He said, but if the prince is here that I have talked with you in verse 25, King Zedekiah goes on, and they come to you to say, declare to us what you've said to the king and also what the king said to you. Don't hide it from us and will not put you to death. Then king says, tell them I presented my request to the king that he wouldn't make me return to Jonathan's house there to die. And that's true. Jeremiah said, please don't let me go back to the pit at Jonathan's. I don't want to die in chapter 37, verse 20. So then just as the king thought, the princes came to Jeremiah. They asked him. He told them what the king had told him to say. So they stopped conversing with him. And Jeremiah then remained in the court of the prison, verse 38, until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And he was there when Jerusalem was indeed taken. Now, Zedekiah and fear. Let's talk about this for a few minutes. Zedekiah is afraid. And Zedekiah is afraid of all the wrong people. Uh, mainly, he's afraid of his contemporaries. I mean, he's got plenty to be afraid of. He's got the Babylonians surrounding him. Uh, he's apparently got people that have defected to Babylon that he's afraid will abuse him if he goes over to Babylon. But mainly, he's afraid of his contemporaries finding out that he's unsure of himself, that he fears. Interesting, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20. 9 and the 25th verse that the fear of man brings a snare. And boy, that's true in every way. And it's interesting that Zedekiah is so fearful of his contemporaries because in reality, especially in Western culture, uh, that may be one of the greatest motivating forces in the life of an American. We talk about peer pressure all the time, but most of us live just as bound by peer, peer pressure as adults as children do, it just doesn't look quite as nasty. We learn to cover it up a little bit. We, we, uh, we buy this kind of car. We live in this kind of house. We do this kind of hobby. We eat this kind of food. We drink this kind of thing. We go to this kind of place. Most of it's motivated by the peers that we have around us. And this is the case with Zedekiah. He's mostly scared of his contemporaries. Now, um, it's funny that Zedekiah should have been more scared of the Babylonians than his princes. But the truth is, as you know, he should have feared God more than he feared anyone. Now, we talk about fear and the fear of the Lord. Uh, fear can be a good thing. Uh, when I used to tell my sons, don't touch the stove or it's going to burn you. I was trying to instill in them when there's a pot that's on the stove and the flame is on, you should have a healthy or a good fear of something. 
The problem is that spiritually and emotionally, the enemy is always trying to destroy people, and fear is one of his greatest tactics. So there is a spirit of fear, which many people deal with their whole lives, and that is not healthy. So people fear all sorts of things, including how they appear to other people. And years ago, a guy told me something that I've always really took to heart. He says, what you fear is what you really worship. Because what you fear, it drives the way you live. So if you fear being poor because you were raised poor, you'll probably worship success. And you can fill in the blank. But Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord is interesting. It's the beginning of knowledge. As we talked about, you can really not have any true knowledge because we are body, soul, and spirit created in God's image. You can't really know if you don't fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge. It's to understand things how they are, to have a biblical worldview. Now, that's not enough. It goes on to say in Proverbs that in chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of not just knowledge, but then wisdom. And when you read Proverbs, Proverbs tells you if you want to get anything in life, get wisdom. And then there's these beautiful passages where wisdom is personified as a beautiful woman to be had at all costs by the seeker. God speaks of himself as wisdom. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 35, Jesus said, uh, <laughs> he said, wisdom is justified. It's shown by all her children. The wisdom that you have in life and the way that you live your life will, will show itself by what you produce. Now, all that said, then, there's a part of the fear of the Lord that is also uh, unique in that Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13 says that the fear of the Lord is not just uh, to have knowledge or to begin to understand wisdom, but the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And last week, we talked about some very hard concepts as it pertains to God does not, and it's not in the Bible, love the sinner and hate the sin. God throughout scripture hates the sinner. We are born with a sin nature. And we don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. So every small child is a sinner waiting to prove it through sin. By God's grace, even though he can't be in the presence of sin, and sin, actually, then, it's his strange act to judge it and act harshly towards it, according to Isaiah. God is at war with the sinner. And yet, by his grace, he gives children the ability to grow and to come to the knowledge of understanding. If they die before they have knowledge, we can make a case in the Bible that he takes them straight to heaven, including those that have mental challenges, like God's grace. And then his Holy Spirit deals with people and loves people and draws people. And the light of Jesus is shown into every heart in the world, John says. And so God hates the sinner, but because God's love is perfect, it's righteous, it's just. God can be both the just and the justifier. So while God's love can't look at injustice. It can't be a part of sin or around sin. Because God is righteous and just, he can't leave people in sin. So in his love, while love demands justice, God sent his son so that he could justify people who will believe in him. For God so loved the world. That's God's love. God hates the sinner, but provides a way for the sinner to be back in a love relationship with him contrary to him is us. We do not have the capacity to hate sinners and provide them any way of escape. We can't hate. What the Bible tells us to do is to hate sin, not sinners. 
And it's why when you talk about uh, figuring out how to war with all the injustice that goes on and the evil, God tells us in the New Testament, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight against the person. We fight against principalities and powers, the spiritual. And we don't fight with fleshly weapons, but as Christians, we fight with spiritual weapons that are powerful for the pulling down of strongholds in 1 Corinthians. So God can hate the sinner and yet love them and provide a way for them. We aren't able to do so. So we hate the sin and we fight for the justice of people on this earth and the freedom of the sinner through Christ in the heavenlies. And so the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. When I begin to get knowledge and wisdom, I'll begin to hate uh, evil. Now that said, uh, what exactly is the fear of the Lord? People are like, what, it, what is the fear of the Lord? I don't get it. I don't understand it. And the fear of the Lord, the best I can describe it, it's, it's twofold. It's the awe and the wonder of the Lord. Maybe you'd say it's the devotion to the Lord. It's also, on the other side, the sheer terror of the Lord. <laughs> I mean, the, the knockdown, drag out, flatten me, scared the pants off me. Terror of the Lord. And the relationship that you have with God shapes the way you experience the fear of the Lord. And years ago, it was shared with me that God is uh, best illustrated the fear of the Lord in an ocean. It, it doesn't do him justice because he created the ocean, but if you, you ever out in the ocean, years ago, I had a ki an ocean kayak. So I'd paddle out of La Jolla Cove and go fish the kelp beds in San Diego, go three, four, five miles out. It's funny because I sold my ocean kayak when I was moving back here. And before I left, my wife was like, you need to be careful going out there. There's great whites. I'm like, look, there aren't any great whites. You know, they're in San Francisco eating people up at Mavericks while they're surfing. And, uh, and then I sold my ocean kayak on a Tuesday and on a Wednesday, there was a 14 foot great white right there where I used to fish. And my, my whole ocean kayak was 14 feet long. I'm like, I think I should listen to Lucinda. But all that said, you know, if you're out in the ocean and on, on a kayak, especially when the swells would get pretty good size, you know, it was so awesome to be out there. And here's all the, the marine life around the, uh, you know, around the kelp patties is unbeknownst to me, also great whites, but you know, seals and mackerel and barracuda and calico bass and just loved it, you know, seagulls and pelicans and all that was going on. And then the swells would get big and you know, you'd be able to see shore out there four or five miles away, but when the swells get big in a kayak, you know, you're up on top and you can see everything and then whoosh, back down and all you can see is water. The power of the ocean, the, man, is this unbelievable. Look at the green and the blues and the, oh, the smell. Now, all that would have changed had I dumped off of said kayak, you know? And, um, and, and it would have been a lot like this. Um, a California man thought that he would die when he fell off of his fishing boat and into the frigid Pacific Ocean. But a friendly harbor seal showed up in the nick of time and helped him to safety. Scott Thompson, a sea urchin diver, blamed, <laughs> this is how guys do it, a lapse in judgment for the mishap that sent him falling off his boat into the Santa Barbara Channel in the middle of the night last month. I thought to myself, Scott said, great, this is how I'm gonna die. Today is the day I'm gonna die. He was wearing nothing but shorts and a t-shirt, he told the news. Thompson said he'd left his boat's motor running and it quickly got away from him. That's when I realized like, okay, we got problems, he said. And I just started swimming as hard as I could towards the boat and it didn't take too long to realize like, hey, it's getting further out and I'm not getting closer. Thompson says this is when he began to fear for his life. The panic set in and I was like, wow, this is a pretty heavy situation, he said, adding that he, keep, he kept telling himself, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. While in survival mode, he kept repeating to himself, you got to get home to your family. I was devastating 
myself through my mind, just picturing my girls and my son growing up without me and my wife, you know, not having a husband to support her. And then a friendly harbor seal showed up just in the nick of time and helped Scott Thompson to safety. But he said all of a sudden he heard this big splash and, and he assumed it was a shark. And when I heard that splash, my heart jumped out of my chest and I was like, blank, a shark. That's what he told the news. <laughs> so as you can see, Scott's relationship to the ocean has changed drastically in just a few uh, minutes. And just then this little seal popped its head up right out of the water next to me and looked at me like, dude, what are you doing out here? <laughs> With no one else for Thompson to turn to, the seal became his bus buddy. He said, he was like my dog. Come here, little buddy, I said. And he'd bop his head up, looking at me, then disappear underwater, pop back up, look at me. He said the little pup bumped him several times right on the butt as if to prod him. It was like he was telling me, hey, dude, get your blanking gear and get going. I was starting to run out of things to say to him, so I sang to him Grateful Dead songs and told him the same <laughs> corny dad jokes that I tell my kids. <laughs> Buoyed by the cheering little creature, Thompson now felt determined to swim to an oil platform, which I've seen this platform, it's like seven miles off the beach, and he reached it in about five hours. He said, as it started getting brighter, I'm just like, I'm crying, and I'm like shouting to the sky. Crew members on the rig provided first aid before the Coast Guard took him to the hospital where he was treated for hypothermia. Um, even putting on a wetsuit, Emergency personnel said being prepared and getting into that water and swimming to that platform would have been horrendous. I can't imagine what it would have been with just a short, shorts and t-shirts on. There was no moon, it was pitch black. And in his post, Thompson wrote, I'm a believer now that there is a higher power. I don't know what it is, but there is a power greater than me. And that was shown to me, and I will never doubt that for the rest of my life. Now, long illustration to say that when you know the Word of God and you obey the Word of God, God is awesome. Man, He bestows blessings upon your life. You can go fish for sea urchins, enjoy the beauty and the power but when you disobey the Lord and you have no fear of God, then quickly the Lord, his power and his glory and his majesty become terrible. And on the day of judgment, I truly believe this, that hell, I used to think, was the complete absence of the Lord. I was taught that. I thought it sounded pretty good until I started really studying and when you think that our God is a consuming fire, the truth is, uh, if that's the case, then hell is not the absence of God. Hell is the complete, unrestrained, consuming fire of God on sinners who have rejected his love without the mediation of Jesus Christ for all of eternity. In contrast, when you think about heaven that needs no sun nor moon for the light of Jesus lights the very heaven for eternity, heaven is the very presence of the consuming fire of God on a life for eternity with the mediation of Jesus Christ. All sin consumed, all wrongdoing consumed, all hurt and pain consumed, every tear consumed, wiped away for all eternity. And I will tell you this, please, uh, as we get ready to take communion, consider this. There are many people that have been driven away from walking with the Lord in church because of the fear or the hurt of man. They've been hurt by a pastor. They've been hurt by a church split. They've been hurt by a hypocritical Christian. They've been hurt. They're angry. Or there have been people who have been driven away because they fear what their family will say, the ridicule, which is about as much as you're going to get in America even today for being a Christian. 
But I'd like to tell you this. Our continued obedience proves that we love him, and it's the only thing that will give people, others, an assurance that we're with him once we pass. And years ago, a guy told me something that I've lived by. I will never let another man keep me from the man. If he is truly the man, there is nobody keeping me from the man. There is nothing that anyone in this room can do to keep me from Jesus Christ. I might hurt for you. You might stumble some people. Not me. By God's grace, he's the only... I've been a pastor's kid since I was little. I've seen every bad thing I think the church can dish out. None of that's keeping me from Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's us imperfectly following Jesus. And so I'm going to urge you to continue steadfastly. And if you're not, if you've drifted away or you're off in the ditch or you've made up your own idea about what Christianity is like, I want to encourage you to know the word and do the word. That's the only way that you can be happy in Jesus. Somebody should write a song and it should go something like, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. And Father God, we pray that as the worship team comes up and we get ready to observe communion, that you'd please impress these things deep down in our heart. Lord, your love, your beauty, your patience, we thank you for it. We ask that you'd pour out your spirit upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.